have any questions or if you want to volunteer, let me know. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> Yuri, how dare you skip over your own sister? <laughs> uh, just kidding. Um, thank you all for coming, and thank you all of the ministry leaders that came here and shared a little bit about your ministry, uh, and hopefully that I don't get to hear things like, well, who is this person? Man, you, you guys saw him or her on the stage and you know you know who Anthony is you know who Alina is you know who Aubrey is you know so hope you get to meet our leaders and pray for their ministry and I just want to say that these ministries are working you know uh, Alina just talked about her ministry and I know my little girls go there and uh, I, I don't think you know fun is fun but they walk away with like man this is what we talked about today and I love it I love it. Uh, so today uh, we're going to continue with uh, Hebrews, and we just have a uh, few sermons on it left, and this is one of them. And um, it seems like as we come to an end of the book of Hebrews, and, uh, which is chapter 13, and when we look at this specific chapter, it seems like the author of Hebrews, he is beginning to land the plane. Uh, and he's doing it uh, very nicely. You know, sometimes the worship leader can't land the plane, right? We're just, <laughs> we're almost done. We're not, one more time, you know. But uh, the author of Hebrews, who is possibly not Paul, but um, he uh, uh, decides to land the plane. He says, like, we're, we're coming, it's coming to an end here, and I just want to say something to you, right? Now it's time to finish the letter, the, the letter. So how do you do that? How do you say goodbye uh, when you're done with the conversation, when you're done with the letter? Uh, chapter 13 is a goodbye chapter, right? It seems like there was a lot of heavy theology, uh, you know, and that theology has come to an end, and the author simply says in verse 1, you know, come, continue to love one another with brotherly love, right? Just one verse. In fact, that's, I'm just going to be preaching on this verse today. Uh, yeah, we, we have like whole 35 minutes or 40 minutes with just this verse, and we're going to just discover this verse a little bit. But, you know, what does it even mean, continue to love one another with brotherly love? Uh, it seems like, well, when I'm talking to my children, and as you know, I have four girls, I can't really <laughs> read this verse to my girls, continue to love one another with brotherly love, right? Well, it has brothers in it. Uh, and we'll explain that a little later. But... Do you have a family member that you tend to not to get along, not, not, not get along with? Do you have a family member, maybe it's a cousin, maybe it's a sibling, where you, whom you butt heads with, whom you don't agree with, who make you cry sometimes or you make them cry? Do you have a family member like that? And I think, well... Probably each one of us will raise our hand thinking like, yes, I have a family member that sometimes makes my life miserable. Sometimes that family member makes my life hard. Uh, parents would say that about their children most often, you know. And uh, children would say that, you know, about one another, you know. So we're all, like, we have one of those, right? And sometimes we even say things like, wow, I wish you would just get married already and get out of my house, right? Or sometimes sisters would say that to one another, oh, I wish you would move on already. And I'm sick and tired of your attitude. Or I wish you would move out of my room and stuff like that. So there's a lot of conversations like that. We all had them. And sometimes even as a parent, when they look at my own kids, I'm like, man, how they hate each other. What is this? <laughs> 
No, they say, no, it's sisterly love. It's, but let someone else, let someone else attack one of their siblings, and they're all in your face. You do not touch my brother. You do not touch my sister. I will stand up for them. I will fight for them. I will defend them. Strange love, isn't it? And it's interesting that the author of Hebrews is kind of like, well, he's describing the church family as a family. Some of you are here because you left another church. Because you got hurt. You know, some of you experienced the pain in the church. And some say, like, well, I am the reason why I am not a, no longer a follower of Christ is because of the church, the people in the church. There's a lot of people that say one thing but do another. There's a lot of lying people. There's a lot of, like, hypocrites, right? And so people make all kinds of excuses not to go to the church. But that's true. Church is filled with people that are not perfect, that hurt our feelings, that sometimes seems like they drive us away from Christ. And the author of Hebrews is actually saying, listen, that's your family. Love one another. Continue to love one another with brotherly love. That's interesting. So let's read Hebrews 13, 1, even though I said it many times already. But I'm going to read it. And since I've been preaching from New Living Translation, that's what I'm going to read it in. But it says... Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Now, the reason why I said that to continue uh, that specific phrase, continue to love each other with brotherly love, is because, well, Greek translation were actually worded this way. And a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, other English translations would, would word it that way, this way, more correctly, right? And you might be wondering why I chose to preach on this specific verse. Well, first is because... It's about love, and I want to learn how to love our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And second, I don't want you to skip over this verse as if you fully understand it. Because you're like, oh, yeah, love one another with brotherly love. Got it. Okay, move on. What's, what's, what does the next verse say? And I'm going to tell you that as we preach on this, well, you might not fully understand this verse, even though it seems so simple, even though it seems so simple. So there's a lot of treasure hidden here that I want us to uncover. So verse 1 begins with, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. And as I said, most translations will say, continue to love each other with brotherly love. Now, I want you to notice uh, one word here, continue or keep on, which means you are already doing it, and I want you to continue to do that. All right? So it's just keep on doing it. Continue to do it. We're talking about love. So the author of Hebrews says, continue to love, right? Continue. So you're doing it. You're supposed to do it. Continue to love, right? Second, it's interesting that a lot of times when we are reading in the scriptures about love and that we are to love, we're immediately translating it as we are to love absolutely everyone with this type of love. And, you know, there's love, obviously, but when this author, he says, love one another, who is he writing to? He is writing to the church. He is writing to the believers. And this message is to the church. And this message is to the believers. Yes, you are to love the people of this world, but sometimes we're so preoccupied with loving the people of this world that we forget to love one another in the church. And sometimes we even make things compar these comparisons where we say, well, I know some un-Christians that are better than some Christians. And so I choose to love that un-Christian more than I choose to love my Christian brother who is not acting so Christianly. He says, continue to love each other. This is to the church. He's saying, I want you to love one another in the family of God, in the family of Christ. 
And then he says, I want you to love one another with brotherly love. And so, ladies, rest assured, this is not just to brothers, all right? This is not just to men. This is the term that I'm going to explain real quick right now that is addressed to absolutely every single believer in the church, all right? So, in Greek language, well, they use more than one word for love. And there's four popular words that they used and probably continue to use uh, for the, the words for love, right? So, for example, the word eros. Okay, that's, that's one word for love, and it's physical love, right? Um, it's physical love, right? So, and then there's another word, storge. <coughs> storge, which is family love which is, uh, it's love between uh, a parent and a child, a child and the parent. You know, it's, it's uh, if I, I love my daughter, and I would say, storge, I love, I storge, I love my daughter. And if my daughter says, I love my mom, she would say, storge, that's, that's love. But that, we know that this word is specifically used within the family uh, parameters there, right? And then there's this famous word, agape, the ultimate love, the head honcho of all loves, right? Uh, John 3, 16, we're translating it like this, right? For, so, for God so agape the world. It's the ultimate love. It's the love that covers all. It's the, and, and when uh, the scripture talks about God's love, it uses the agape love. It's the one, it's the, it's the love. And then, and then in this specific war, verse, he says, love one another. He's using the word Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Uh, there is a city that's a pretty popular city in the United States, Philadelphia. We have Philadelphia Eagles, right? The nickname for the city is the city of brotherly love, right? Philadelphia is a Greek word, which means brotherly love. And if you watch football, and, you know, there's a quarterback sneak or that little push, right? They call it the brotherly push, right? And for, like uh, uh, with Philadelphia Eagles, right? It's, they're using that specific word. And that specific word is called brotherly love, which comes from the root word philia. And this ancient Greek word spoke of brotherly friendship and affection. It is the love of deep friendship and partnership. This word Philadelphia is used here in verse one, brotherly friendship and affection. Brotherly friendship and affection. Sisters, it's sisterly French, uh, friendship and affection. Now think about your siblings. If you don't have any, think about the closeness with your cousins. You know, think about that relationship and think about that specific love. You might not always like each other, but man, you'll die for one another. So, and here I am, I, I'm just looking at this specific verse, and I want to I talk about it. I want to describe it a little bit. I want to see what the Word of God actually says on this type of love, and I want to look at some examples in the Bible, and I want, and I want to get a lesson out of it. I want you to walk away on how to love with brotherly love. Listen, I could talk about it for weeks. I only have some time. So I'm going to give you three examples on what brotherly love looks like in the scriptures. All right, first of all, and this is our first point, brotherly love does not envy. All right, this brotherly, sisterly love, it does not envy. James chapter 3, verse 16 says, For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Well, you might say, like, this has nothing to do with brotherly love right now. Why are you talking about jealousy? Well, let's talk about jealousy a little bit just to get to that point. Brotherly love does not end me, but there is jealousy. Jealousy happens. It says, where there is selfish ambition and jealousy, there you will find disorder of every, uh, and evil of every kind. Envy is one of those things that can tear a family apart. 
It is one of those things that makes you uncomfortable uh, around certain people. When you're envious, you don't really want to look someone in the eye. You don't want to grab a cup of coffee with them. You don't really want to talk to them. You are uncomfortable around them. Why? Because, well, you are envious and you are uncomfortable, so you don't really want to see these people. Sometimes it makes you bitter, angry, and oppressed. It causes you to hate and it causes you to belittle another person. Sometimes, probably, you might have said that before to someone else. Are you better than me? Oh, you're acting this way because you're better than everyone else? Right. <laughs> Are you better than me? Are you better than everyone else? Or some say to, uh, to God, actually, God, why are you blessing him and her, but not me? God, why are you blessing his business over my business? God, why are you blessing his ministry over my ministry? God, why, why does he have such a good family or she has such a good family and I don't? And so we tend to be envious a little bit. And sometimes when we're envious, even among each other in the church, we don't pray for each other's well-being. We don't bless one another. Sometimes we even hope that we would fail because I'm envious. It happens in the family. There's a story in the Bible, a story about David and Jonathan. And uh, before I read the specific passage, you know, let, let me tell you this story between David and Jonathan, right? Uh, Jonathan was a prince. His father was Saul, King Saul. Jonathan was in line to be a king, all right? Jonathan, Jonathan was going to rule uh, Israel, right? David is a peasant, all right? This come, he's a shepherd. He comes from nowhere, right? And then Jonathan recognizes Saul and Jonathan and everyone else. They realize that God is anointed David to be the king. And then we have two reactions. One got envious. Saul, he got really upset. He got really angry. And so we know as soon as Saul found out that David is destined to be the king, Saul wants to kill David. And we, we read, that's the relationship between uh, King Saul and David. Saul wants to kill David. He wants to destroy David. He wants David to fail. And then you have Saul's son, who is supposed to be the next king. So he who understands that if David becomes the king, then, then Jonathan does not become a king. Who understand if David becomes a king, then his own family might be in danger. Because back then, when a king uh, uh, ascends to the throne, he kills everybody else who has a claim for the throne. So, so he understands that his life might be in danger. His children's life might be in danger. And so this, this Jonathan, this Jonathan, instead of siding with his father, instead of trying to kill David, he says something really interesting. And this is the last time they see each other, right? He found out that King Saul wants to kill him. So Jonathan runs out into the field and warns David that my father actually wants to kill you. Run. And in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 13 through 15, he says, he gives him a blessing. As Jonathan saying this to David, may the Lord be with you as he used to be with my father. And may you treat me with the faithful love of the Lord as long as I live. But if I die, treat my family with this faithful love, even when the Lord destroys all your enemies from the face of the earth. He literally says, my father is your enemy right now. And at the end of this passage, he says, my, your God will get rid of my father. He will erase Destroy all your enemy from the face of the earth. That includes my father. <laughs> he says, he says, David, you know, he could have handed him to his father. He could, have, he could have just put a dagger in David's heart right there and then and ended all of this. No, he says, the Lord is on your side and may he bless you. May he bless you. I know, David, that you are about to take my spot. I know you're going to take my throne. I know you're going to take my life. I know you're going to take my fortune. All of that that's supposed to be mine is going to be yours. And David, I bless you. David, I bless you. And I worship the God that 
puts you on this throne. So may this God bless you. Wow, what a love. What a brotherly love where there is no envy there, knowing that this man is going to take your place, knowing that this man is going to enjoy your your fortunes, your riches, your kingdom, knowing that you are going to be erased most likely. And still you look that man in the eye and you say, God bless you and may he bless you even more. May he bless you even more. Jonathan was supposed to be the next king. The throne was rightfully his. He heard that God would put David on the throne. He could have protested like his father. He could have conspired against David. With David on the throne, his family would be in danger. But he protected David. It says that he loved David more than himself. At one time, there was only two swords in Israel. And Jonathan gives David one sword basically half of weapons goes to David, right? He he gives it to him. That's love. That's love. And then at the end, he blesses David and David's future kingdom. What can we learn from this? Well, to love with brotherly love is to reject envious spirit and to bless your brother or your sister even if it will cost you. Let me repeat this. To love with brotherly love is to reject envious spirit and to bless your brother or sister even if it will cost you. That's the first type of or point of brotherly love. Brotherly love does not envy, but it blesses. Second, brotherly love shows kindness. Brotherly love shows kindness, and it shows kindness in the most difficult times. Luke chapter 10, verses 27 and 37 talk about a good Samaritan. And it's interesting that it begins with a Jewish man, a Jewish man that traveled from Jerusalem to Jericho, right? So Luke uh, 10, verse 30 says, A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. So let me tell you a little bit about the relationship between the Jews and Samaritans. Jews hated Samaritans more than anything. Jews prayed evil upon Samaritans. Jews never talked to Samaritans. Jews never entered Samaria. And if a Jew was to accidentally touch a Samaritan, it was the same thing as touching a dead, decomposing body. And then he would have to go to the priest and he would have to go through all these rituals and stay away from everyone for seven days or so because he touched a Samaritan. They hated Samaritan. They did not wish well for Samaritans. They prayed against Samaritans. They prayed against their well-being and so on they never pronounced a blessing on a Samaritan because they hated them this much and the reason why Jesus is actually bringing this story up is because he's telling the Jews how wrong they are in hating a brother or in hating a a neighbor so Jesus specifically uses that language here he says a certain Jew was traveling so as I explained Jews and Samaritans did not speak to each other they hated each other especially despised Jews especially despised Samaritans with all their hearts they blocked their success any way they could they prayed sorrow and destruction upon them for a Jew to touch a Samaritan was to touch a dead body it's the same thing right and what did the some, uh, when we were looking at this Jew that was beaten up and was uh, left for dead right and I look, at, I look at him and I think about him and I feel like he's just like every other Jew. He felt the same way about the rest of the Samaritans. He did. But what did the Samaritan do when he saw this unfortunate Jew? Verse 33, and I love how Jesus actually he uses this language. He's like, and then a despised Samaritan, right? He's talking to the Jews, like everybody, the, the guy that everyone hates. Despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Man, do I feel compassion for the brothers and sisters that hurt me? Do you feel compassion for those that hurt you? Do you feel compassion for church people that 
really hurt you because those are the people that hurt the most, I think. Do you feel compassion for them as they hurt you or when they're hurt, but they've hurt you a lot? What did this Samaritan do? Verse 34, going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. And then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. This is brotherly love. It is to have compassion for the unfortunate brothers and sisters. Do I have compassion for the unfortunate brothers and sisters? It is to take care of them when they cannot take care of themselves. It is to bandage their wounds with kind words, with encouragement from the scriptures, and acts of love, even if these brothers or sisters hurt you and caused you a lot of grief. Brotherly love that we are called to love with does not allow me to pass you by. Brotherly love that I am called to love with does not allow me to pass you by, especially when you are in need. We're talking about church family, my friends. We're talking about church family. So, all right, brotherly love does not end me. Brotherly love shows kindness. And finally, brotherly love forgives. Church, maybe there's a reason why I'm preaching on this specific verse. Is there someone you haven't forgiven? Is there a church member or a, a, or a believer that you've encountered that hurt you or you hurt them and you haven't forgiven one another? Because when we're called to love with brotherly love, it's not necessarily just the way church, love everyone in the way church only. No, you're called to love every believer with brotherly love. Is there a believer whom you have not forgiven, whom you cannot forget, whose trespasses are still haunting you and you haven't talked it over? Is there a believer that is like that in your life? Brotherly love forgives And the best example in the Bible and in all human history is Jesus Christ. And take a look at his relationship with his disciples. Do you remember how his disciples, his closest friends, treated him before he was crucified? Remember how they failed him? In the time of need where he needed them the most, man, they failed him in the biggest way. One... Jesus' closest friends in the group could not stay away, awake and pray with Jesus in an hour when his soul was in deep agony. They could not stay. They, he's asking, please pray for me right now. Please, please pray with me right now. They could not stay awake. Their minds weren't even there. They really didn't believe him. And so in his time of agony, they were not praying. They were sleeping. They were non-existent to Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. One of his friends, he sells him for money to be killed. Except he didn't think they were going to kill him, but he sells him for money, right? Three, Peter, after saying he would die for Jesus, denied him three times, even after being warned that he would do so. One of the closest friends, out of those 12, one of the closest ones is the one that backstabs you, is the one that says, I don't know you, is the one that watches you being whipped, watches you being crucified, and he says, I don't know him. This is not my guy. This is not my friend. I've never been this with, with this man. I've never seen him in my life. This is your best friend saying that to you. Can you imagine that? In a time of need, when your husband or your wife or your close, or your child, or your bestest best friend says, I don't know you. And they walk away if they've ne- as if they've never known you. They, they, they leave you to whatever it is that you're struggling with. And four, all of them forsook Jesus and deserted him when the soldiers arrested the Lord. All of them did. Interesting. In one passage it says, like, one of the disciples was grabbed. But he ran so hard that he left his tunic in the soldier's hand, and he says he ran away naked. 
The guy didn't care. I'm going to run naked from my friend. They all forsook him. They ran away from him, and he, Jesus was left to stand trial all by himself. So if I would be Jesus' advisor, then my verdict would be, Jesus, you chose the wrong disciples. Jesus, you failed there. You chose the wrong disciples. And then my suggestion would be, Jesus, leave them. They are failures and they are cowards. You, they don't deserve you, Jesus. They're failures and they are cowards. They were not there for Jesus when he needed them most. They ran from him when he was mocked, beaten, and crucified. And he had every right to abandon them too. But what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? What did he call them after he was resurrected? In Matthew chapter 28, verse 10, he, uh, when women went to see uh, Jesus, uh, well, went to see the tomb, and they see Jesus being, they encounter Jesus in, 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 uh, there, uh, and then Jesus says to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my who? Cowards? Backstabbers, filthy liars, those unbelieving 12 or 11 now? No, he says, go tell my brothers. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. He called them brothers after they betrayed him. He called them brothers after they left him. He called them brothers after they watched him be crucified and they ran. He called them brothers after they promised to stand by him and they failed with their promise. He called them brothers. He did not leave them. He told the women to share the good news with his brothers. He told the ladies that he wants to see his brothers. So what happened when Jesus saw his backstabbing brothers actually? And it continues in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. It's known as a chapter of great commission. You see, you know what happened when Jesus saw his backstabbing brothers? They were forgiven, accepted, and empowered. They were forgiven, accepted, and then he empowered them. He says, go now. Now you know. Now you see me. Go and preach the gospels, gospel to the ends of the earth. Brothers, I forgive you. I forgive you. And so this is the best example of brotherly love is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So how do we love? Uh, how do we love? Well, brotherly love does not envy. Brotherly love shows kindness. Brotherly love forgives. So... There are just few, uh, these are just few of many examples in the Bible that teach us to love with brotherly love. And in Hebrews 3, 1, we are charged to love with Philadelphia love, brotherly love. So the world would, be, would see the family of what, what family of Christ looks like. So the world would see what family of Christ looks like. Brothers and sisters, I want to say this, my dear church, show your love to the world for one another. Love one another. Stop talking about one another. Bless one another. Stop cursing one another. Bless one another. Don't walk by when someone is in need. Help one another. Let the world see what the family of Christ is all about. We are to love one another. And the world is to see that love because the world cannot have that love. They don't have that love. And they need to want that love. And we are to practice that love. So we are called to love with Philadelphia love. John Piper said, It is the affection of a family that comes with long familiarity and deep bonds. Of course you can have squabbles and get mad, but let some bully pick on your brother and the family affection shows its powerful side. Or let one of the family members get a life-threatening sickness or even die. And there will be a kind of tears that do not come for others. So, honestly, it is impossible to love everyone like that. It is impossible to love with brotherly love often. Well, that's the truth. It's actually impossible to love. 
with brotherly love. It is impossible for us, but it is not impossible for Christ. So, by the power of Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, it is now possible to love with brotherly love. So love. Continue to love. And keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Amen. As the worship team comes back up here, um, just let it sink in for a couple of seconds. And maybe as you're closing your eyes right now and you're getting ready to pray, there's this name, there's this face, there's this person whom you haven't forgiven, whom you've despised or despised you, and so on and on and on. It's just like, it's just, it's just a painful, uncomfortable story. Maybe you need to repent today. Maybe you need to ask God to forgive you for not forgiving, for not loving, forgive you for, for uh, being envious, forgiving you, forgiving, uh, you for not being uh, kind. So maybe that's something that you need to do. Maybe, on the other hand, you, are to, uh, you ought to pray, God, help me not to be envious. God, help me to be kind. God, help me to forgive. I know what I need to do. I need your help, Holy Spirit. And I know by the power of Holy Spirit, you are able to do that. You can. So who is this person? Heavenly Father, I pray, thank you. Thank you for your love and for your mercy. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for every verse in the Bible where we could just look at and we can pick it apart and we, and we can talk about it. Your word is alive. It's powerful. God, it, it does not come back empty-handed. Lord, it always has a purpose. Your word, the one that we're uh, reading, it is Holy Spirit. It is inspired by you. So every single word was whispered by you. So we trust that and we believe that. And so you're calling us to love one another with brotherly love. Lord, help. Help us to love each other with brotherly love. Lord, help us to display that love in such a fashion where people of this world would see how this church loves one another. May the people of this world want that love. And that love is only obtained through Jesus Christ. So help us spread this message. Help us to love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Hey, Josh, would you stand with us as we close our service with a song? Still more.